Professor Sujit Datta and dear participants, good afternoon and welcome to NICE lecture on engaging with rising China, options for India. Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is an independent, apolitical, and non-partisan think tank which believes in freedom, democracy, and world free from conflict. We envision a world where sources of insecurity are identified and understood, conflicts are prevented or resolved, and peace is created. China studies and neighborhood studies are our major research center at NICE. To talk on very interesting topic of today, we have very distinguished scholar from India, Professor Sujit Datta. Professor Datta, uh, we are really grateful for your kind presence. I have been reading your work since I was a student at Jawaharlal Nehru University, and I had the opportunity to listen to you at several of your lectures and presentation at IDSA while I was working there. Professor Sujit Datta is a distinguished fellow and editor of National Security at Vivekananda International Foundation, New Delhi. Previously, he was professor at Nelson Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Studies, Jamia Milia Islamia, New Delhi. He is a political scientist and international affairs specialist. His principal area of research and studies are Chinese politics, foreign and security policies, India-China relations, international affairs in East Asia, India's strategic thought, international relations. Till May 2009, he was senior fellow and head of the East Asian Studies Program at the Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, IDSA. India's premier think tank on strategic and security studies. Professor Datta has been a member of India-China Eminent Persons Group from 2001 to 2005, and the National Security Council Task Force on China from 2006 to 2007, Council for Security Cooperation in Asia Pacific Working Group on Confidence Building Measure, 1994 to 1999, and other high-level bodies devoted on international peace and security building. He was also senior fellow at the prestigious United States Institute of Peace, Washington DC in 1997 to 1998, and a visiting scholar at the Institute of National Defense Higher Education, Paris 2006. He holds a PhD on China's post Mao diplomacy, a style and substance in boundary negotiations with India from the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He was a senior editor in PTI in charge of foreign affairs before he was invited to join IDAC in 1987 to strengthen research on China and East Asia at the IDSA. With PTI, he also served as, as a correspondent in Beijing and has a diploma in Chinese language. He regularly lectures on China, India-China relations, East Asia at the National Defense College, the War Colleges of the Three Services and Universities of India and abroad. He has published a large number of research paper and chapters uh, in books and has edited and edited the books on India and the world, a strategic thought, the formative years. He was the associate editor of the country's leading strategic studies and international affairs journal, a strategic analysis from 2005 to 2008. And in that capacity, transformed it into a referred international journal published by Rothley's. Mm -hmm. Professor Datta, please make your presentation in 30 to 40 minutes, which will be followed by question and answers. And uh, this program is streaming live on several Facebook pages. We'd like to request all our participants to share it on their social media. We'd also like to request all our participants to drop their questions on the Facebook Live or in Zoom chat room. You can also tweet or WhatsApp your questions. Professor Data, the floor is yours. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that uh, to receive uh, Dr. Jaiswal's invitation and uh, Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement's in invitation for me to me to speak on this very important topic. Uh, and uh, me to all of you, uh, interact with all of you, although it is through the computer, but that is how it is nowadays anyway. Um, so I'll um, focus on uh, the uh, India-China relationship. Uh, in the context of uh, what is going on today uh, in the Indo-Pacific, Asia-Pacific, uh, or the larger Asian situation, uh, where enormous changes are taking place, and um, uh, there is a great deal of uncertainty in, our, in everyone's mind about what is the nature of the uh, Asian future or the Indo-Pacific future. Uh, our the central issue in all this, of course, uh, remains the um, issue of China's rise, uh, because uh, significantly, 
um, so many of these changes or the uncertainties that are related to China itself, uh, the, how China's, China's power is growing, what impact it is having on multiple dimensions of the global order, and what are China's uh, outlook towards uh, the region and how it will uh, it wants to both conduct its foreign policy relationship, its economic policies, and engage the wider world. So I'll devote myself briefly to the kind of issues that China's rise has posed for us, then deal with the uh, India, India's responses to them, and then uh, finally, some of the options that India is uh, trying to grapple with in terms of the a wider framework of the Indo-Pacific and the Asian uh, environment. Now, all of us are aware that this current growth uh, in rapid growth in China has been made possible by the post-Mao reforms of whose architect, principal architect, was a group of reformers led by Deng Xiaoping. And uh, they uh, were the ones who took very bold decisions uh, in terms of opening up China, uh, which is extremely close to economy and uh, politically uh, and uh, secluded from world affairs uh, till 1978-79. Although uh, the Nixon Kissinger, uh, Nixon Kissinger engagement with Mao and Chou Enlai uh, did lay the foundation of a new beginning for China, in terms of enge wider engagement, but everything actually began to take shape with the new economic and reform policies that Deng Xiaoping uh, initiated in 1879. Uh, over the next four decades, China has become very large uh, in terms of its economic, military, and other cap capabilities, as all of you know. Uh, now, given the size of China, uh, this is, uh, 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 has enormous impact on the rest of the world, and particularly to the Asian environment and the Indo-Pacific environment in which China is located. So that must be kept in mind, China's enormous size. Uh, the only other two countries, or the only country other than China that has similar size is, of course, India. And India's growth and modernization are going to have similar impact on the rest of the world. And so we have this dimension um, of the gigantic nature of India and China and their modernization uh, simultaneously as a very, very important factor that is shaping the current world order and the Indo-Pacific order in particular. But there's a third element to it, and that is the United States, the leading global power uh, currently, and that is expected to remain leading for some quite some time uh, uh, with this lead in technology, economy, uh, as well as military affairs. Uh, and it remains a principal balancer uh, in, uh, in the Indo-Pacific and the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, so uh, plays a very vital role in global uh, investment trade and global security. So it is this triangular uh, India, China, United States relationship that is of key importance when you discuss uh, the overall environment in which India, China's relationship is being forged. Now, let me make two, three very important points regarding China's rise. One, um, the reform itself, of course, was critically important and a reformist leadership that was put in place since then, since the late, uh, early 80s. But it also uh, a fact uh, that uh, the huge growth in Chinese uh, capabilities took off after China joined the World Trade Organization uh, in 2001. And therefore, a critical element in China's rise has been made possible by uh, the deep cooperation between China and the United States in particular, also therefore with uh, Europe, Japan, Southeast Asia, Korea, et cetera, that are part of the American alliance system. 
happen. So the US-China relationship forged in 1972, thereafter strengthened post-79, and thereafter further strengthened in 2001 as a result of the Chinese entry into the uh, World Trade Organization following the US-China agreement on trade issues is critical element of uh, facilitating China's rise and its entry into global markets, uh, the huge transfer of technology and, and global chains into, into China's manufacturing, and therefore China becoming a hub for global manufacturing. So many large companies have you know, shifted their production base into China, and much of the trade uh, is between international companies located now in China. Uh, and China has become a center uh, from which its own domestic economy has enormously gained. Chinese companies have risen out of it. And therefore, this rise is deeply related to the trust and cooperation between China and the rest of the world made possible in the early years and early decades of the uh, uh, 21st century. Uh, the Chinese growth, as I said, has been, was systematically, therefore, a high one, uh, and it has led to China today becoming a $14 trillion economy, uh, a $200 billion military budget, uh, a $200 billion plus, which is the latest figures, uh, and uh, therefore, we are going to see uh, the capacity building in China uh, rise constantly. Uh, uh, there are some messages coming here. You're fine. Okay. Removing um, them. Yes. Um, uh, so this this is the backdrop, which is critically important. The co cooperative elements that made possible the globalization, the partnerships that were built in this period. And yet, as you know, one of the important elements of uh, Deng Xiaoping's messaging was uh, uh, to tell China that, look, peace, long-term peace is important for you. And uh, yet, uh, the nationalist goal uh, of um, uh, making China great is simultaneously very important. And so he had instructed, as you know, hide uh, in a very pithy uh, or uh, statement, hide your strength, bide your time. And by the 2007-8 period, when Hu Jintao was still in power, the party general secretary, uh, the Chinese began to feel uh, that as the world was um, going through and beginning of the financial crisis, that the American power was really uh, in decline. So this debate on American decline began to pick up very rapidly. And uh, so the conclusion drawn from that, uh, because the soon thereafter the financial crisis hit uh, the world very badly, particularly the United States, and the major conclusion, strategic conclusion strong from that was that with the US in decline and China's rise inevitable, there is now the time is ripe for China to assert itself. That is, hide your strength, bide your time, that biding your time, the time has come um, for, for now making an assertive assertion of China's presence. And one of the principal things at this time was Hu Jintao's um, meeting with Obama, in which he, uh, he, uh, he generally put forward the argument that US and China should forge a special relationship in which America accepts China's interests, core interests, and China accepts America's core interests, and thereby a kind of a duopoly is created. Uh, the Obama administration did, uh, the, some American thinkers did accept that kind of a thing as, as a reasonable one, but the US 
finally did not accept that formula, uh, despite um, both Hu Jintao and thereafter Jiang Zemin's efforts to this, eff uh, to this effect. Uh, so post-2010, two things have happened. China has been increasingly assertive. Its capabilities have grown very rapidly. China's uh, new leader in two th was uh, uh, Xi Jinping, who proclaimed uh, his own China dream to make China great at the earliest possible time. There were very important dates coming up by which they would want to achieve it. 2021, this year, is the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party. Uh, so a time to show that the Communist movement is, in China has really made China great. Uh, second was 2027, the 100 years of PLA's founding uh, that showed that the Chinese are going to be the leading military power in the world, competitive with the United States. 2035, China would set itself as a major technological power, leading technological power, and by 2049, the 100 years of the uh, creation of the People's Republic of China, they would become a fully developed country with comprehensive power in all directions. So these were the kind of uh, time periods in which the Chinese leadership uh, foresaw its own role and shaped its policies accordingly. And there was an urgency to it. And therefore this assertion was part of this urgency and it largely explains what has happened in two zero, um, between 2010 and 2021 this year. And particularly, I think some of the moves that it took in 2020 during the pandemic crisis. So, uh, it's, it, it, if to this audience, I think it doesn't have to be told uh, that China now uh, is the second largest economy in the world. Uh, it's the largest trading nation. Uh, it's because of the global change that emanate from it now, because of the reasons that I mentioned already. Uh, huge trading takes place. Uh, China has, has a major shipping industry. Its ports are crowded. Uh, goods are flowing, and it's a critical part of the global economy today. Simultaneously, China has built its military power uh, with double-digit growth for many years now, uh, and it's got now in size itself the largest navy, uh, though the American navy is, uh, has greater capabilities, but nonetheless, the Chinese navy has very large capacities in terms of vessels, etc. And it's also building um, other the missiles, uh, major missile power, nuclear power, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going out into space and it's building very strong capabilities in the cyberspace domain and artificial intelligence and all those air frontier areas which are going to shape the emerging competition among states, in particular the United States and China. Uh, with whom the Chinese are engaged in a major rivalry at this point of time. Uh, as I've told you, uh, the early, the first decade of 2010, uh, till 2010 of the century was still earmarked uh, or marked by US-China cooperation. Uh, but that steadily a sentiment of competition began to pour in thereafter as Chinese assertions began to pick up, reflected in, in China's expansion in the South China Sea, as well as its assertion of territorial claims in East China Sea in Senkaku, et cetera, against Japan, uh, its assertion on its, uh, on its claims on uh, Taiwan, and its other neighboring countries in terms of unsettled boundaries, but principally India. So this assertive plus China's role, growing role in the world have gone together for quite a while for the last decade or so. Uh, this was already there before 2020 and the pandemic hit us. Uh, the pandemic brought in a very interesting dimension 
China certainly has uh, been blamed uh, by many uh, and uh, the World Health Organization, I don't think has finally come to a major conclusion regarding uh, the, uh, the failure of China to inform other, the world uh, fully or in time regarding the Wuhan virus. Uh, and the virus, as you know, has become a major issue for, with so many people across the world suffering and one doesn't know how long it will continue. And this major effort, it requires global effort, has been diverted to fight, fighting the pandemic rather than focusing on other critical issues that are uh, on our uh, hand today. And the global economy has been severely hit by the pandemic. So uh, issues of power, power balances, strategy have been deeply affected and shaped by this crisis caused by the pandemic. Uh, now, this is the case. What is uh, the uh, current status and how, where does, how does this affect India? Uh, so let me spend some time on the India part of, of the uh, China, uh, the, uh, the China relationship, as uh, the uh, as the uh, uh, Chinese power has grown and uh, the uh, Asian environment has changed, or the global balance of power has begun to change. Now, in 1988, as you know, because of the 1962 war, we didn't have uh, normal relations with China for a very long time. Uh, and um, only in 1988, after, after really nearly two, 28 years, uh, the Prime Minister of India, uh, Rajiv Gandhi at that time, went to China. Uh, this was a very long break uh, in order to normalize relationship. Uh, they, they already, uh, the foreign minister of India in 79, the Atal Bihari Vajpayee, the Janata Party led government, had visited them. Uh, but, uh, and uh, the diplomatic talks had started. But it's only in 1988 that uh, the first high level prime ministerial visit from India to China took place. And in this, that meeting, a very important decision was taken that has set the course of India China relationship over the next. Uh, 30 odd years. What was that? It was based on the talks between Deng Xiaoping and Rajiv Gandhi. Deng Xiaoping made an important uh, offer, a proposal, you could say, that the two sides, uh, given the complexity of the border problem, which is the principal problem between them, to set aside the border issue. Uh, set aside differences while expanding areas of cooperation. And cooperation basically meant economic cooperation, normalization of summits, re regular visits uh, of, at all levels, uh, and business ex being expanded. China was, as you know, now very interested in trade expansion, investments, uh, and wider security around its per periphery so that it could deal with the international system in a, more, in a more secure and stable manner. So the India relationship began to become important. And for India too, the uh, reforms in China, as well as the changes that were taking place globally with the Soviet Union going into a crisis and thereafter the Soviet, uh, the socialist bloc breaking up meant newer uh, strategic calculations had been made and the China relationship became suddenly very, very important. Now, the Indian position till then had been that the border issue was the real issue. It must be settled uh, so that other areas of relationship can thereafter be built on a stable foundation. Trust can be built and this can be put aside. But uh, the Chinese were not uh, prepared to do so. And therefore, Deng Xiaoping's formula had to be slightly uh, adjusted uh, by uh, because of the insistence of India to say that, okay, normalization of all other relations will take place while simultaneously there will be discussion to resolve the boundary issue. So a two-track approach was started. 
uh, and this can be broadly said to be the beginning of the India-China engagement post-1988, and therefore the India-China engagement <coughs> sorry, of the reform period of the for 88 onwards, that means fundamentally last three decades. This was the framework in which India-China relationship grew. The effect has been uh, uh, several, <coughs> sorry, one, the two countries have signed several major agreements to stabilize the relationship. We call, we call the confidence building measures, uh, 1993, 1996, uh, 2005, when uh, two basic principles uh, to resolve the boundary issue, uh, drawing up the political parameters, etc., were, uh, were drawn up. Uh, and finally, 2012, when even more clarification took place regarding confidence building measures and maintaining peace and tranquility as the basis of the India-China relationship. And there was this strong understanding under, underpinning all these four agreements that use of force, forcible change in the territorial nature of the current line of actual control will not take place. And both sides will engage in peaceful talks and negotiations to settle the boundary. And the focus will be on first getting the line of actual control delineated since it, you know, the Chinese were not at this point of time prepared uh, to settle the boundary issue. Uh, at least the line of actual control should be defined. In 1997, they took a decision uh, to delineate the line of actual control so that accidental military uh, action doesn't take place. Uh, and it was to buttress the confidence building agreements that had already taken place in the Peace and Tranquility Agreement of 93 and the CBM agreements of 1996. So it followed those agreements. Unfortunately, uh, the soon after the first set of talks took place on the small sector, the Himachal, the uh, Uttarakhand sector, uh, the Chinese withdrew, uh, the lost interest uh, on further exchange of maps and the delineation of the line of actual control. Um, I think they did not want to be pinned down to stating where the line of actual control is uh, so that uh, they could continue to bargain hard and create a line that was more suitable for them. So they didn't want to, at this point of time, get bogged down because the Chinese claim line itself has been a flexible one. It's changed from 56 to 59 when Chiang Lai put larger claims and then in 62 it again changed. And finally, it has been flexibly in the line of actual control has been flexibly, has kept deliberately flexible uh, rather than settle it, which is what India wanted and which is what the 1997 agreement and all the CBM agreements uh, want to do, basically maintain peace and tranquility and the borders, non-use of force, settlement of peacefully, and a fairly the boundary question, which is at the core of the instability that lies in India-China relationship, uh, or at least till recently, that was the only one that was really a problem. But of course, now as China's power has changed and widened, its capacities have grown, newer frontiers are opening up and uh, the maritime sector, the cyber sector, space, uh, the regional questions all have become important in India-China relationship, uh, as China's uh, economics and trade. Uh, included. So uh, this is the this is a very important element to keep in mind when you see that as a result of Chinese assertion post 2012, uh, first uh, at Chumar, uh, all, all of them in in um, in Ladakh area, the Chinese effort to expand the line of actual control uh, uh, in a deep way started taking place. So then Chumar and then in Debsang, 
uh, thereafter in Sikkim area in, in Doklam, uh, where China's claims into Bhutan uh, came very near the Indian boundary, uh, tri-junction, uh, and the Indian military had to intervene. Nonetheless, China has occupied uh, part of uh, Bhutan uh, in 2017 and has kept, uh, hasn't moved its troops away from there. And finally, in um, 2020, China did something most unthinkable. Now, uh, it's pushed in 2020, April, it began to push large number of its troops into the eastern Ladakh area and from north to south uh, east Ladakh, uh, it started redefining or forcing uh, its claimed line forward. Uh, basically, its line of actual control forward uh, in areas that were uh, very much understood to be Indian, uh, part of the Indian line of actual control, or Indian understanding of the line of actual control, and where patrolling by the Indians took place regularly. Uh, this, since the area was large, and India's own infrastructure building, which had, uh, which were, uh, which followed uh, years and years of Chinese infrastructure building in these areas, uh, had come late, but were now had been taken up with great. Uh, firmness by the new Modi government, uh, the Chinese seemed to be wary of them and started contesting this entire area significantly. And this is what has started uh, in a very large way already um, taking place 2013 onwards. But now it was a concerted effort. And the Chinese pushed a very large number of troops and forces into this area, I think going up to like 50,000 troops with artillery and all the other things, latest gadgetry, military weapons, etc., put in place. And the Air Force was again. So there was, and it's this contest that is the setting of our current relationship. Now you can imagine, uh, as a result of this, when the Chinese, first of all, uh, entered a parts of Indian territory, uh, the line of actual control, that is, uh, and thereafter did something which was even more unthinkable. Uh, as you know, part of the CBM was uh, that when the, uh, when the two armies meet and talk about a certain dispute in that area, they would not carry any weapons or would not attack each other. But the Chinese, uh, attacked Indian soldiers through uh, something very primitive in nature and totally unexpected, barbed wire uh, clubs. And, and the sudden attack on unarmed Indian troops, 20 of them were killed. The Indians thereafter, of course, retaliated and uh, at least 40 to 50 Chinese soldiers have been killed by all estimates. But the fact remains, that the killing of the Indian soldiers uh, was the first major death on the border area since 1975, when four Indian soldiers had been killed in the second sector. So this is uh, an extraordinary uh, development from the perspective of, of India. That means the peace and tranquility agreement and the CBM agreement, which are the crucial element of the engagement policy underpinning it because the other part of the engagement policy which is to finalize the line of actual control if not the border itself has not taken place because the Chinese have not shown interest in it uh, despite the 1997 agreement the maintenance of the Four agreements, the CBM agreements, were critically important. Now, this has been violated, and the first deaths have taken place in 75. This, of course, in terms of change in public opinion and the elite opinion in India, has been very, very, very sharp. Very importantly, has changed the entire nature. And the entire paradigm post-1988 was based on engagement and expansion of trade, et cetera, by which the Chinese gained enormously. As you know, India-China trade has shot up to about 
in 1887-88 billion dollars in 2019-20 and even this year despite the uh, current pandemic the trade volume remained very high of around 80 billion dollars so the uh, the entire edifice of the expansion that has taken place with Chinese investments in India around seven to eight billion dollars. Uh, the Chinese having a very large market share in several areas, electronics in particular, but also in smartphones, uh, in boiler, uh, power sector and the boilers uh, being imported from China, as the Indian electricity uh, uh, grids, etc., expanded rapidly, uh, solar cells. So some of these areas and the automobile parts of automobile manufacturing, which is a very large industry in India now, all these have uh, gained, given China a very large share in the Indian market. India-China trade has grown very rapidly as a result, since particularly since uh, 2001, uh, entry of China into the World Trade Organization, and more importantly, after 2005-06 in particular. Yet, despite all this, and the two very important summits that took place in 2000, uh, it, it, uh, 17 and 2019, between uh, Modi and Xi Jinping, one at Wuhan and the other at Mahabalipuram in, in near Chennai, uh, is, uh, and that, despite those which reaffirmed the commitment of the two sides to maintain peace and tranquility, expanded their continuous meetings many times in the forums of Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the United Nations, at uh, the East Asia Summit, in the BRICS community, et cetera, et cetera, multiple meetings. And within six months of the Mahabalipuram uh, uh, agreement and the meeting, the Chinese troops were uh, staging this kind of uh, territorial expansion and aggression, uh, which has had, as I've said, a very traumatic effect on the India-China relationship. The Chinese, of course, have not portrayed it as such. Their media has portrayed it as something that India initiated. They can't explain why. Therefore, the Chinese troops were present there before, much before the Indians were there. Why such large numbers were used? Why did this uh, suddenly uh, attack the Indian soldiers. All this has not been explained to their to their people, uh, and um, uh, remains part of a narrative that they are trying to build. And finally, on 19 February this year, they have uh, 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 accepted that four of their uh, commanders died, and so they've been honored. And an uh, important a kind of uh, political environment was created just before the NPC was supposed to start, the Ch Chinese parliament is supposed to meet. Uh, now, uh, it, it, the, the two sides have now finally, you know, following India's very strong military response in this area, uh, and it's resolved diplomatically and politically uh, not to give in to Chinese uh, use of force uh, and meet force with force uh, has uh, meant uh, that the Chinese have not been able to do what they wanted to do. But nonetheless, the troops uh, in uh, disengagement in several areas is not taking place. Uh, India uh, created new leverages by occupying the heights in Felash range, uh, which forced the Chinese uh, then to come and negotiate properly. And at least in one area, uh, there has been disengagement. Was, uh, and the threat of war that was very serious at one point of time has slightly receded uh, to everyone's great um, comfort but a tension remains as long as uh, the rest of the areas at least in three other areas uh, the troop disengagement fully doesn't take place as agreed at the ninth and tenth round of the military level talks so we are now confronted with a situation where India-China relationship is undergoing a dramatic change and shift. The relationship, as I've told you, uh, has not been easy in the, all these years, despite the changes, despite the agreements, despite the engagement uh, and the CVMs that, uh, that, that I mentioned, despite India's efforts 
uh, to build a normal relationship as desired by Kung Shopping's uh, formula that in areas, other areas, we should expand cooperation, which is done. Uh, the Chinese were allowed into the Indian market in a very big way. Uh, summits have been regular. India has joined the BRICS uh, and China is part of it. India has joined Chinese efforts like the AIIB, India is a major shareholder, uh, and the new bank uh, created by the bank in the Indian side uh, provided the CEO, uh, built the bank in a significant manner. Uh, we are members uh, to be meet together in the Shanghai Corporation Organization. Uh, despite all this, uh, there has been an effort uh, uh, which is totally contrary to this entire process that has shaken the roots and foundations of the post-1988 uh, 1988 engagement strategy and the Indian belief that that strategy is finally going to lead to an outcome of settling the boundary issue and thereby creating long-term peace between India and China, which means that conflict and cooperation are a part and parcel of the relationship that has not been overcome despite India's efforts to build a peaceful relationship based on cooperation, cooperation rather than conflict as one element of it. <clears throat> so what, do, what is the option now? What is the situation that is unfolding? What is taking place? Now, very, uh, the, the foreign ministers of India and the foreign minister of China have had several meetings and uh, including uh, the last one, which was uh, some days ago in, in this month, uh, the Indian side has been very clear that the two sides must respect each other's concerns. Uh, the, the line of actual control must be delineated. Uh, there cannot be any normalization in India-China relations, normal business as usual in, in India-China relations, unless the peace and tranquility at the border and in Ladakh area now and the rest of the border is re-established. Uh, the Chinese pull back uh, to where they were before when they entered these areas and the disengagement takes place fully and the two sides then can start doing serious talks about both the LSC, uh, delineation of the LSC and how to improve their overall understanding of the relationship. This will be, of course, in the new context of uh, India uh, being much barrier. Uh, engagement will be redefined uh, in, a, in a manner that takes into account uh, the Chinese practice rather than what China says, because the obviously agreements, the cetera signed with China uh, have lost uh, the uh, the meaning uh, and the significance on the, that uh, uh, that uh, such such important agreements are normally uh, meant to have, and uh, uh, so a new strategy uh, is evolving, uh, keeping in mind uh, the, uh, the experience that has taken place over the last decade, in particular, but most importantly, post 2020 April. What are the elements of this now therefore going to be? Uh, because the Chinese position on the other hand has been, look, the boundary issue is an issue. Uh, it should be separated from the rest of the relationship. The rest of the relationship must not be affected and India should get back to cooperation in, on economic and other areas. Uh, because uh, one of the things that has happened is now India has restricted Chinese entry into several areas on security grounds uh, and uh, while without affecting uh, the normal trade as of, as of now, but uh, the Atmanimur Bharat plan has been launched to uh, enhance India's manufacturing cap capacities and reduce dependence on China in some of the sectors that I've mentioned to you, such as electronics, telecommunication equipment, uh, and others that have security implications. Uh, so, uh, a new kind of economic response uh, coupled with strong military awareness and military preparedness along the 
boundary issues so that the, ter the territorial question does not get out of hand and China cannot push uh, rough shore over any area and start something, another crisis uh, in another area uh, because the claims are all alive. Uh, and finally, on the maritime sector, strengthening of the maritime forces uh, because the Chinese are also creating large naval forces and expanding into the Indian Ocean, building uh, ports, bases, etc. as the, uh, the Navy expands into right of Africa and further in the, in the, uh, the Chinese PLA Navy. So, and the theater of engagement, you could say, between India and China has rapidly expanded as China's power has expanded, forcing India to respond. And this particular uh, year, when the Chinese broke all norms, it seems to me, in the context of COVID crisis with which we have been grappling, and which, with which the world has been grappling, and therefore it is unthinkable that China would ever do such a thing, take military action, not only against India, it started taking military actions in South China Sea, it stepped up to its operations in the Taiwan Straits and Taiwan, it took actions in, to break the 1997 agreement in Hong Kong and bring Hong Kong to book, as you know, with the enormous suppression of the democracy movement, etc., and also stepped up suppression uh, and repression in Xinjiang and Tibet. All this is part and parcel of China getting, it seems, prepared to show that it was very sincere in ensuring that its claims were now well within reach and taken care of by the time the centenary of 2021 centenary of the, Com of the Communist Party takes place. That probably is the only explanation we can find because everything else from that engagement they had with India was so favorable to China. Uh, how would the otherwise it be explained? Uh, what, what they did. Uh, so but the deed has been done. Uh, Chinese have overreached. And as a result, a very important relationship between the two major Asian powers has been very badly affected. Uh, India is now um, uh, into its own reforms in a significant manner, its own economic building, its infrastructure building. India is looking forward to significant growth. And all the indications are that over the next 10 years or so, India will become the third largest economy in the world. It already is in terms of purchasing power parity. But this time, in real terms, in the exchange rates, uh, taken into account, uh, it, India will likely to become a $10 trillion economy. And it will be reflected in the larger wealth among the Indian people and capa all around capacities in technology, in the military field, uh, in the social sector, and in India's ability uh, to reshape the Asian environment and the, in the immediate uh, neighborhood in more meaningful terms with, through its own economic engagement, uh, uh, economic cooperation, and uh, trading, uh, and wider trading, etc. Um, so, making India strong, uh, a reforming India, a wealthy India, and a trillion dollar economy at the earliest is the immediate goal. This will have enormous implications. I've told you, just like China's growth uh, into a $14 trillion economy has had on the world, uh, India's growth into a $10 trillion economy by 2030 or so would have a similar huge impact is already beginning to make itself uh, important for the rest of the world. And uh, Indo-US relationship is becoming a critical, important relationship in shaping the new Asian strategic environment. Uh, the India uh, factor is now increasingly seen by the world as critical uh, to uh, any balance of power, a stable balance of power in Asia. So what do we, what is there, uh, the future ahead of us? It's very clear that the Asia that is emerging is going to be very uncertain for a while. 
because the Chinese uh, have not given any indication that they are going to stop at building their capacities, that they are going to stop as, at claiming what they believe to be their uh, area in uh, Senkaku or in the Ladakh sector or in Arunachal, uh, where they have very large claims in the another Indian large state. Then uh, uh, in the in the on the, on Taiwan or on the Taiwan Strait area and in South China Sea, so the prospect of tensions are very high, and this is in the context where uh, the major uh, powers like United States, Japan, India, and Australia have come together rapidly to forge the quadrilateral uh, grouping. The quadrilateral grouping is a follow-up of the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, the strategy to keep the Indo-Pacific Indo area open and free and inclusive uh, from naval uh, challenges posed by uh, various countries, but most importantly, China, and establish a rule-based system so that this does not take place. So much like what India has been trying to do in the powder area to, be, to have a peace and tranquility based on certain fundamental principles and certain fundamental agreements uh, and a very clear delineation of the line of control and the boundary, a similar effort is uh, on in the Indo-Pacific region between these four powers to build a system based on rule of law rather than claims, counterclaims, and occupation, and unilateral use of force. Uh, this, uh, this is uh, the key to these four countries coming together uh, to deal with the rise of China and its impact, and what has gone on for the last decade or so, as you know, as part and parcel of the Chinese assertion of its claims and rights to uh, these areas, which are contested areas where others other states like Vietnam, Philippines, Japan, uh, the, Malaysia, Brunei, in that part, in India uh, on the boundary, in Bhutan on the boundary. So all these states are affected and if these states are very large states and it affects the sea lanes of communication in a major way because the South China Sea in the Ocean region is the most busy uh, sea lane, has seen as a conglomeration the most busy, busy sea lanes in the world. And trade is constantly growing. The Indo-Pacific, in the meanwhile, is becoming, has seen a transition from the erstwhile Atlantic complex to uh, the Indo-Pacific as the major center of global geopolitics. The largest economies are here. The three, uh, the four largest economies are here, um, including Japan, uh, the trading routes are changing and are deeply embedded in this area. The military, the largest military powers are concentrated here. And the global order is being reshaped by these rising powers along with the United States. Engagement between the India and the United States and the Quad, therefore, is going to become a very, very large area. The first meeting of the, the first summit of the Quad has just taken place, as all of you know with a large comprehensive agenda, uh, whereby they're going to focus uh, not only on the COVID, uh, dealing with the pandemic in a, in a manner so that all countries gain from it. India is going to be the hub of the production for of vaccines for the, for the world. It already is, but even more pressure, uh, more uh, impetus will be given to it. Uh, Two billion doses are to be uh, distributed worldwide, uh, mostly from manufacturing in India by 2022, uh, by next year, that is. Uh, in addition, uh, the four countries are going to cooperate on climate change and critical technologies and simultaneously work on areas to, do, de to keep the area free from uh, basically challenges that disturb the law of the sea uh, and therefore the maritime sector. So we, I think uh, uh, India's, uh, uh, the other response of India is to strengthen its global, global partnerships with the United States, Japan, Australia, France, 
uh, and Russia in order to deal with the challenges uh, that are posed by China. So what happens to India-China relationship? What happens uh, to the Asian uh, peace and tranquility, which are critical for advancement of all countries, including China? I think much will depend on what China's own choices and policies are. Does it want peace, stability, and an environment in which it grows? It is very clear uh, from the agenda that the uh, Chinese leadership has set, the China is continuing to go, uh, grow uh, in power. Uh, its economic power is going to grow. It's becoming a major technology power. So it's going to set uh, uh, technology is going to be a very major area of competition among the major powers, particularly the United States and China. The pushback has started, uh, and therefore the scope for conflict has risen. And therefore, it's very important uh, now as to what countries are going to do in this particular case. And therefore, the Chinese response and approach hereafter is going to be critically important. It's also important what the Quad and what India does and what the United States do, do in this area. I think the Quad is going to be a major pillar of stability. And the Indian role in it will be to promote uh, wider engagement provide alternative uh, to the developing world, to the smaller Asian countries in terms of finances, in terms of the ability to deal with the global crisis like the pandemics, uh, and also enable to them to deal better with China. The um, dependence on China as the Indian experience of the, uh, or the experience of the world so far has shown is not easy and to be immediately translated into several types of manipulation in terms of foreign policy gains, et cetera. And so uh, the Quad, I think, has become a very important element of India's own strategy and rapidly actually grow, it has grown as a result of um, what China's actions have been in 2020. So I'll leave it at this thoughts uh, and we can pursue the matter further. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Professor Sridhatta, thank you very much for a comprehensive and enlightening lecture. We really learned a lot and I'm sure our participants also benefited from it. We have received a huge number of questions. So without any delay, let me share the questions that we have received. Professor Dutta, the first question for today is, why had China refused to sort out the border issues with India? Does China want to warn India not to approach the United States? Similarly, how India can assert on its territory conflict with China. Do you think India should rethink its China policy? Should India renounce one China policy? I've tried to club a few questions together. So this yeah. is the first question. Well, I told you um, that the United States uh, has not been a, uh, I mean, in 1997, when we agreed uh, uh, to delineate the, bound, uh, the line of actual control, uh, the U.S. Uh, was not a factor in the India-China relationship in, uh, directly. Uh, India and China were engaged in their bilateral negotiations. A series of agreements had already been forged in 93 and, and 96 uh, on CBMs and the, and the uh, delineation of the line of actual control would have solved the problem. Today, this situation that has arisen in Eastern Ladakh wouldn't have arisen. So, I think um, the U.S. factor, as uh, many would like to uh, indicate, that means basically saying that India-U.S. relationship, uh, the growth in India-U.S. relationship is, uh, has affected it, uh, cannot be borne out by the kind of historical details that I've already given to you. Uh, secondly, what should India do uh, to deal with it? Uh, should we change the one China policy, et cetera? Uh, well, um, everything is on the table. Uh, the, 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 the Chinese side, as you know, uh, in, uh, the Chinese claim is on uh, not a boundary per se, but on very large parts of India. That is, the whole of state of Arunachal Pradesh is chained by China. I mean, it's a part of the. Uh, is it one of the provinces of India? It, it, it's it, it's people are citizens of India. You're not claiming mountains and uh, you know some un, un, uninhabited areas. 
these are people. Uh, Chinese are claiming populated areas, uh, people who are part and parcel of uh, India, who are citizens of India, uh, bound by its constitution. India governs them. India sovereignty exercises sovereignty in these areas. What is the point in uh, advancing such uh, claims uh, and keeping them alive, which are so impractical and which never, will never be conceded by India? So uh, they are only kept up as pressure points, it seems to me, and it could lead to conflicts. And secondly, therefore, one has to deal with these pressure points. And as I've already said, in Eastern Ladakh, it has now gone out of hand. And what the Chinese have done is totally unacceptable. Uh, and it's led to uh, India countering with its own uh, show of force, and troops have been rushed, and the two sides were very near eyeball to eyeball contact with very large forces staring at each other. So it's a very dangerous game to play. And I hope the Chinese leadership uh, will rethink its entire strategy and start uh, doing some serious work on, with India in terms of delineating the line of actual control as soon as possible so that this kind of thing doesn't arise. One China policy uh, is, uh, can always um, be part of the situation worsens. Because after all, India, China is openly violating Indian territorial uh, areas in, the, uh, in, the, in Pakistan-occupied Kashmir, which is a sovereign part of India. Uh, it's legal sovereignty in the POK belongs to India. It, the whole of Jammu and Kashmir state joined India in 1947. Uh, the war, uh, following the war, the Pakistan have retained a part of it, uh, which is the PO, POK, and the Chinese are happily building without respecting India's sovereignty, legal sovereignty, uh, in a disputed territory that is occupied by uh, Pakistan, uh, the uh, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Uh, I mean, this is another violation. So uh, one of the things is in principles that uh, the foreign minister of India, uh, external affairs minister of India, Jashankar has advanced, is reciprocity. Uh, that you, uh, you respect our concerns, our sovereignty, we respect your concerns and sovereignty. You show us uh, force, then we'll show you force. It'll be based on reciprocity. And so which direction uh, will be chosen? What options India will choose in terms of our Taiwan policy, our Tibet policy, uh, will depend on what the Chinese game plan, its policy responses, the lessons it learns from this crisis, and what it wants to do in terms of building relationship with India as uh, Asian environment changes, as India's own power and capacities change, and as Chinese trade, investment, economic relationship, and diplomatic relations with India get very badly affected. So I think it's a very important part of uh, uh, the question is basically uh, what will the Chinese do and what kind of responses will therefore India will be forced uh, to take. And some of the things that India will do in the coming years if the relationships do not improve. Uh, so let me move to the next question. Uh, like there is discussion in India on boycotting of Chinese products. There are discussion on Art Nivar Bharat. Mm -hmm. Can India afford to boycott Chinese goods? Uh, what will be the impact on, what will be its impact on Indian economy and India-China relations? We have been getting these questions even in our previous events. Yes, of course. So as you know, as I've already told you, despite uh, the, uh, there was a severe boy uh, pro boycott movement through this period, because of the uh, Chinese attack on Indian forces and the killing of the 20 troops. Uh, and uh, many Chinese goods were boycotted uh, in the Indian market. Uh, uh, but if you see the trade figures for the year, uh, trade has not fully declined. Uh, it has been a margin, margin, marginal fall uh, because um, India has not stopped trading with China as yet. Uh, but what the Atma Nirva Bharat uh, indicates is that India is going to uh, uh, do its own manufacturing in very many critical areas so that it doesn't have to depend on China. Uh, and we should see in the coming three, four, five years, 
India's capacity in manufacturing, in telecom, electronics, etc., rise significantly and rapidly. Uh, so, uh, uh, and also India will diversify its sources of imports in some of these areas. So I think both these things will take place uh, in the coming years. Uh, total trade cutoff is not being envisaged after all. India is, does not, India is not in a uh, war game with China. Uh, India is still interested, as I've told you, in uh, peace and stability uh, prevailing here. Uh, our economy is both Indian and Chinese and the rest of Asia, uh, which are dependent uh, and look at the growth of India as their own uh, sources of growth as well. Uh, they're all interested in maintaining long-term peace in this area. And therefore, uh, it's not in India's interest to cut off uh, all engagements with China, uh, all trade with China. Uh, and uh, even uh, certain areas of investment, as you know, the smartphones are operating in India. We haven't uh, closed down their factories. Many of them are be now being produced in India, Redmi, et cetera, et cetera, are now producing in India. So uh, uh, those have not been touched. Uh, India does not want to aggravate so that the relationship collapses altogether. But I think, um, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, side is uh, somewhat uh, not, uh, not following this principle that the normative, uh, just to say that the latest uh, provocation has come in the form of China insisting that visas being applied by Indians and others, I mean, several other countries, to get that visa, they'll need to uh, take the Chinese vaccine. Now, why should Indians take the Chinese vaccine uh, when India is uh, the la uh, largest producer of vaccines in the world and it's already producing two major vaccines. There are three, four other lined up, which are going to come soon. And there are other vaccines that India is going to be producing, like the Sputnik uh, made by Russia. India is going to produce them, start them produce soon. Johnson & Johnson's, the American vaccine is going to be produced in India. And there are other efforts but under the Quad, under which India is going to be uh, producing many more vaccines in very large numbers. So making these are the, the conditions, which will mean that travel between uh, India and China, uh, for people's movements between India and China, trade and education and the tourism will all be affected. Uh, so I don't think uh, many of the steps the Chinese are taking now are well thought out or in the principle of uh, what they say that we should turn to normalcy. Uh, there's a deep and the great need uh, between what the Chinese are uh, saying and what they're doing to be bridged uh, as soon as possible. Uh, so there's another question by Ambassador Niranjan Bhasnet from Nepal. Uh, he's asking, India's policy has transformed into China-centric policy. Does India have any policy to take, in, take its neighbors like Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka into confidence? At present, India's relations with its neighbors are not very good. In this context, does India have confidence in itself, both economically and militarily, to deal with China? Uh, I think that the basic proposition is not correct. Uh, the India's relationship with its neighbors, uh, barring Pakistan, uh, remain very strong. And uh, India's uh, relationship with Bangladesh in particular uh, is extremely strong. Enormous changes are taking place in terms of infrastructure building. As you know, recently, a major um, opening from Northeast India, the Tripura state, into Chittagong port, the linking rail and road through an Indi Indian built um, long bridge system uh, has taken place shape. It's changing the, the entire nature of the interdependence between India and, Ch and Bangladesh and therefore Eastern region of India, Nepal and other Bhutan, et cetera, will gain from this and their own access into these markets as well. India-Nepal relationship remains, there are problem, uh, certain uh, complexities in that, but the India-Nepal relationship is irreplaceable by any other relationship, including the China and Nepal relationship. Uh, everyone knows that. Uh, the India-Nepal relationship is an extremely unique relationship. 
Uh, Nepalese virtually enjoy dual citizenship in India. They work in all areas of India. They work in the Indian Army. Huge number of Nepalese are, uh, get pensions from India. Uh, the Indian and Nepalese markets are unified markets. Uh, the, the relationships are deeply ingrained in culture, history, uh, geography, uh, river water flows. Uh, I mean, it's a culture, a language. So what else can I say? I mean, Nepalese uh, uh, democratic experience is heavily dependent on cooperation and learning from India. And India looks upon Nepal to become a strong econ economy, a thriving nation, uh, our, the large number of Indian projects have been there all throughout and even more are being built. So, I don't know, certain political issues uh, should not uh, make us uh, oblivious of what the ground realities are. And so there's irreplaceable, uh, unique relationship between India and, and uh, Nepal. Same with the Maldives. You know, the Chinese landed in the Maldives in a very bad situation given their large uh, debt-driven uh, development uh, finance uh, and it, uh, $3 billion for a small country like Maldives, which is much larger than their GDP, is unsustainable. Now India is, very, is cooperating with Maldives to overcome that problem. Uh, Sri Lanka face, uh, uh, faces similar challenges uh, down the line and we are um, uh, in constant touch with uh, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka is part of the Beamstack, as you know as Nepal is, uh, and Bangladesh are, and Myanmar are. And that effort is uh, to enable these countries to uh, be strong, to give them alternative models, to give them alternative sources of finance, to alternate sources of trade. Uh, India is the only one that can do it. Uh, and we are doing so, she got concerned. One who's seen what has happened in Ladakh, lack of resolve on the part of the Indian military to take on any challenge, to secure our nation. And uh, we are building our military to be as one of the strongest militaries in, in the world. And uh, we'll take on the challenges of China whenever it is posed to us. Uh, so we're running out of time. So we'll take maximum two questions. Uh, yes, do, you, uh, do you think China has dramatically increased its presence in South Asia. As Chinese President Xi Jinping has visited almost all South Asian countries, except Bhutan in a very short time. Xi visited India and Pakistan several times. What might be the reason behind it? No, they have increased. There's no doubt about it. And that's the, not only in India, South Asia, the Chinese presence throughout Asia has grown. Chinese presence in Africa has grown. Chinese presence in Europe has grown. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a part and parcel of the growth of Chinese power capacities, trading, uh, and the growth of China. The rise of China means this. So it has grown in our area as well. And as you know, the Belt of Red and Road Initiative promoted by China uh, has, uh, South Asia as a major hub, uh, the CPEC runs through Pakistan. And, um, Another route was supposed to open from Yunnan province uh, to into Bangladesh, uh, Myanmar, and come to and then reach uh, Kolkata. And uh, so uh, that, uh, as a result of the deterioration in India-China relations and the trust uh, lack of trust, India has uh, withdrawn from that. Uh, it's not allowed that in. India has opposed the Belt and Road uh, system as a whole because it violates Indian sovereignty in Jammu and Kashmir. And uh, the overall Indian assessment that this is not uh, the kind of developmental program uh, that is sustainable and is very opaque and the small countries are going to suffer uh, because of a debt led uh, economic model. So th this debt uh, is a problem, serious problem built into the system. Chinese have large number of large amount of money. Uh, they keep giving it, uh, but uh, one day it has to be paid. And how do you pay? I mean, do you pay it through sale of Humban Tota, et cetera? So I think um, uh, India um, wants to uh, deal with these questions in its own way, uh, through its own efforts. It has its position, it has taken its position. 
China's influence uh, in the uh, therefore has grown in our border areas, uh, trade, etc., uh, in uh, neighboring countries around us. Uh, but I think the expansion of the Indian economy is going to uh, neutralize some of that. And as I said, the general advantage that India has in terms of connectivity, in terms of relationships, in terms of our political uh, systems, in terms of cultural roots and, and our contiguity, all mean that there is no way in the smaller countries around India cannot but have strong ties with India. And these ties are going to grow over time as India becomes a larger trading nation, um, invests more in these countries, uh, and uh, its ties with uh, the overall Indo-Pacific area becomes uh, very, very dynamic. And this is going to happen over the next 10 years or so. So uh, I'm very positive uh, that the region is going to be very important for India. Uh, India sees the neighborhood as a very critical for its security. Uh, and though the Chinese presence is there and it will remain there, uh, all countries are free to trade with each other. Uh, there's no problem with that. As long as that does not become an instrument of politics and politicking. So that's all you know, we are concerned about. And that should not pose security challenges to India. If any effort is made to create a very long-term security challenges in our neighborhood, then of course India will respond in a, a way that is appropriate. So let me move to the last question. Uh, like China's border conflict with India are the most important aspect of India-China relations. And the 29-17 uh, Doklam military standoff, uh, 2017 military standoff uh, to 2020 Galwan Valley violent classes have increased trust deficit in bilateral relations. And bilateral agreements such as like border peace and tranquility agreement of 1993 or MCBM of 1996 uh, as you mentioned, have failed to stop uh, violent conflicts in border areas. So do you think that Indian policy practitioners need to uh, need to stress more on realistic techniques in its dealing with China? And the trade relation with China cannot uh, achieve optimal standard unless both nations uh, can have a peaceful border in a peaceful environment. So do you see India and China have impressive and increasing trade despite of constant border tensions? which you have partially uh, answered during your previous question. Uh, the, uh, the agreements that and how it will restore uh, them, what role it will play, uh, the Indian position is that that trust must be restored. It has to be the basis for building the overall relationship. In order to do that, uh, the LSC needs to be defined as a, as a first measure. So uh, a lot of things are still going to, uh, are still in the future, uh, in the making, is not in, in India's hands alone. It is, uh, the other side, uh, the Chinese uh, concerns. So as I told you, so much depends on what China wants to do. Uh, the, the CBMs, uh, uh, it, it, it would be wrong to say that the CBM system, et cetera, did not work at all. I think they worked for a very long time, as long as the Chinese were not interested in stepping up and asserting their claims. Uh, so the first decade or so, to the first two, uh, two decades or so, uh, things were under control. They're no more under control because the Chinese are challenging them, their own agreements. Uh, they want to assert uh, 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 and claim that so-called unilateral claims as their sovereignty is the problem. So I think, as I said, they are working. They need to new to spend. It's to be constructive or negative 
in the command. Uh, so we are looking at an uncertain period. It's not a settled new engagement policy. It certainly solve, uh, as I said, some of the basic issues that lead to conflict and tensions and misunderstanding. Defining LSE and keeping the LSE undefined, what is the sense of it? What kind of, I mean, you, you want to settle the boundary? You don't want to settle the LSE? What was the game plan? What, keeping things unsettled so that it can be uh, sources of tension. Uh, to, uh, the tensions will be raised whenever you want. I mean, quietened when you don't want. So this is a game, it's a dangerous game, right? Large states should not play such games. And uh, let me say one thing. China is uh, a permanent member of the Security Council. The permanent members of the Security Council and have a principal role in playing a responsible role in maintaining global peace and security. That is the role given by the UN Charter to these five powers. That means these five powers will be custodian, principal custodians of maintaining peace and order in the international system. Now, if one of these powers behaves in this manner, what, what kind of responsible UN leader is that? And what happens to the UN system? And what kind of Asia can we build? And such powers are going to be uh, on this track of thinking and practice. It's something that the Chinese need to think. They're sending a lot of messages to every country around. They're watching China. We are watching them. And uh, it's in everyone's interest to build a peaceful order in Asia, build, build a peaceful order in the maritime sector through which trade, energy flows, so much economic activity takes place. It's very important in the coming decades that we take full advantage of global growth, technological change, uh, to overcome poverty and developmental lag, the history of colonial backlog uh, that has affected us so badly. After all, India and China were the leading countries of the world till 1820, providing more than 50% of the global GDP together. We want to restore that which can only be done by through development and, and peace and security is the basis of development. So I think a huge amount of rethinking is done and Chinese are very unilateralist, a very single-minded uh, with, um, uh, with self-orientation that is not becoming of a responsible power. Uh, and they need to be more universalistic and certainly more committed to actual peace rather than talking about peace all the time. Uh, thank you, sir. Professor Sujida, thank you very much. Here we come to the end of the webinar, though we still have lots of questions. And uh, thank you once again for the wonderful discussion. We immensely benefited from it. We are really grateful for your valuable time. We hope to have you uh, here in Kathmandu in real someday. We'd also like to thank all our participants for their wonderful questions. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day.